So now we've seen all of this stuff that goes into creating believable surfaces and realistic renders and all of that. And important as it all is, it is not the complete story. There are some additional considerations which need to be kept in mind, which I just want to give a quick mention to here. And these considerations are ones of modelling and texturing. The simple fact is that you can have all the great lighting in the world, you can have, you know, the best surfacing and shading in the world. But if your models or the textures that are on them are a little below par, then you're going to be limited in what you can actually achieve in terms of a render. For instance, there's some very obvious elements, right? If you're trying to do a realistic human head and your model is basically a sphere, then you're clearly not going to get very far. Of course, we mentioned textures and the same does go for texturing. Again, if you're trying to do a, you know, realistic human head or something and this is your texture map or perhaps this is your texture map, then you might be able to get a decent render of the head, but it's certainly not going to be photorealistic human. That's going to be an awful lot harder to achieve if you have textures of this sort of level. But even having passable models, if they're missing certain little details, can start to look a little fake. The most common modelling detail is edge bevelling or edge softening, such as we see here with two cubes. They're both identical, they've got exactly the same surfacing, but this one here on the left looks very CG and very fake, whereas this one over on the right, although being very basic, does look just a little bit better. And the reason is because it has these tiny little bevels at the corners here. It's very rare in real life to see perfectly hard corners like this. Maybe on the occasional object or material like a cut diamond or something you'll see a perfect edge corner. But otherwise they're exceedingly rare. Have a look at your desk or your mobile phone or your monitor or your door frame or pretty much anything else that you care to think of that's sort of square, rectangular, right angle corners. You'll find that almost all of them have just a tiny little thin softness to the edge and what that does is as you can see here it catches a slightly different highlight or low light as you roll and look around it. You'll be surprised how often such small scale details in them really can make a difference to how well your renders come out. A model that is perfectly decent and perfectly passable in the main can still end up looking a little bit fake if it's missing some of these crucial little hints that point to something more realistic. Something else that is often very important when it comes to modelling is having things at a real world scale. Of course our lights and everything are behaving in a real world fashion. Their fall off and brightness is based on their real world scale and many material shaders can also have an effect based on scale. The most obvious being ones that include some sort of transparency or absorption or especially subsurface scattering. As such, having your models at a reasonable real world scale, here I've got a head which is going from what just below the neckline to the top of the head here and it's just over 30 centimetres high, around a foot, give or take, realish scale. Keeping scales realistic like this will also be a boon. Of course, there are certain exceptions, and that's when you start to get things that are very, very small or very, very big. If you're doing some sort of medical visualization and you want to have some bacteria, then modeling those at a real world scale is probably not advisable. Or similarly, if you're doing some sort of space shot, stars and planets and the like are also not really recommended to model at real world scales. In those circumstances, you would tend to use lighting effects or other such things to create a sense of scale. But with everyday objects on a scale that we're used to interacting with in the real world, including sometimes some quite large things like buildings, or even some relatively small things like grapes, then it is worth sticking to real world scale modelling, as it will require you to use fewer compensations in your lighting and camera work in order to get the correct sense of scale. Something else that's very important to consider with modelling is different types of material surfaces and the kind of geometry that they sometimes need to work properly. For instance, here we've got a box and it's got clear glass panes on each side. I mean, this could be windows in a room, right? Or it could just be a car 
with you know windows around on all sides and what we see here if we look at it you know from a, an angle like this is it doesn't really look particularly great we've got some weird refraction going on here now we can see that there's just these three or four should say red balls inside and as we come around the corner here it looks a bit weird in fact what it sort of looks like it looks a bit like a fish tank how you see these strong refracted versions of the innards from different sides and of course you've also got these very strong internal reflections when you see that it's an interesting look and certainly in the case of something like a fish tank it's the kind of look you'd be wanting but in the case of something like a car it most definitely is not however if we have a look at a different version of the object such as we have here then something starts to look quite quite different we're no longer getting that strong bent refraction on each side and when we look through it does very much look like we've got a window on this side and windows on the opposing sides yeah we see this quite clearly perhaps on this angle here i'm looking through one window and then there's just this empty box and then clearly there's another window and another window this is more what we would expect to see in a room with windows or a car with windows and so on here we can see what the actual difference between them is in this first case then the item is just this plain box with flat, infinitely thin side. Both the walls and most importantly in this case the windows are only one polygon thick. As such, when the renderer sees this, it does not perceive it as a room with four separate windows. Rather, it perceives it as a solid block. And so what exists between this window and this other window on the other side isn't empty space the renderer treats it as if it was solid glass all the way through. This version, on the other hand, does not have single polygon windows. What we see it does in fact have is actual panes of glass with real thickness. As such, it sees this, the front side going to the back side, as a solid block of glass, and then past that, it just sees empty space. Until, of course, you get to another block of glass or window pane on the other side of the object. Another very important thing of course is dodgy geometry. This guy here might look all well and good but if we take a close-up look well we can see that there's something not right at one of his corners here. He's got an unwelded edge where of course his vertices aren't meeting up correctly. It's a tiny, tiny little error. You only see it when you're super zoomed in, but it is there. And this will often give you shading errors, or especially if you're using global illumination, light leaks and the like. Non-planar polygons, where you've got polygons like this, which can never be tries. Tries are always planar, but quads or n-gons can become non-planar. These sometimes go a bit weird in rendering, but not all that often. Most of the time they just look a bit kooky in OpenGL, which fails to really render them properly. You get these strange sort of shading where it goes bright to dark. Everything gets triangulated in render, so those usually aren't a problem, but do watch for them in certain circumstances or with certain material types. They can sometimes cause you funny issues. As of course, can any kind of you know, inverted or overlapping geometry like this cause you some bother. Again, very much so when you are dealing with transparent or scattering base surfaces. If you've got any geometric errors of this type, that can cause shading problems. If you do appear to be getting little light leaks or certain shading artifacts, it is worth having a look in the render properties here in layout where you'll notice that there is a polygon intersection mode Having that set to fastest will often shave just a tiny little scotch off your render times. But if you do find that you've got misbehaving areas of geometry, such as light leaks or some shading artifacts, you can always try it at watertight or double precision to see if that cleans them up. If, however, none of that works and fixes the errors, then the most likely explanation is that there's something wrong with the geo itself that needs to actually be repaired. So there we go. These are the additional considerations that really need to go into 
having things set up to get good renders out. If going through this training you are wanting to use better models and better textures because either you don't have so many stored or you're not as confident of your own modeling or texturing skills or you're just not wanting to spend the time to make this stuff before getting stuck in wet rendering, then do note that with the exception of spheres and cubes that we're using in these demonstrations, all of the models that feature in this training are just downloaded off the internet along with all the textures and all for free. A quick Google search of free 3D models or wood texture or whatever else will throw up plenty of results for you to be able to experiment with yourself. Some items of course you'll find in the content with these videos, but do go online and grab yourself some high quality assets if you feel the need so as you can practice working with the renderer without the need of having to worry about taking care of all these additional considerations for yourself.